Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. We're going to start the session now. Thank you, Tom. And good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Lisbon Aqu Aquarium. My name is Shakuntala Haraksinkinstead, and I am the global lead of nutrition and public health at Wolfish, one CGIR. Wolfish is a CGIR entity dedicated to the scientific research and innovations of aquatic foods in food, land, and water systems. And I will be moderating this session today. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this 2022 UN Ocean Conference side event, a sea change for small-scale fisheries, global leadership, towards SDG 14B, preferential access for small-scale fishers and inland exclusion zones. This session is organized by the Transform Bottom Trawling Coalition, a global movement of 54 organizations from 24 countries, working to constructive and equitable solutions to the impacts of bot bottom trawling. Today's side event is for the co-sponsors by partners. Oh, we don't have the um, we don't have the partners up. Um, at the at the end, I would name the partners for you. Before we start the event, I'd like to inform our in-person and virtual audience that this session will be also interpreted in French which is channel three, and Spanish, in, that's channel two. To kick off this event, please allow me to invite Dr. Issam Yassin Mohammed, Director General Woolfish, to deliver his opening remarks for the session. Issam, the stage is yours. Thank you, Shakuntala. Um, no, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, let me um, acknowledge um, the organizers of the event, um, Transform Bottom Trolling Coalition, but also the Blue Ventures and many other partners. And let me recognize uh, the distinguished uh, uh, panelists as well for today's event. I think today's event, um, uh, um, I'll, 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 I'll make an effort not uh, uh, to be slightly more emotional or passionate as I speak, because this is something very close to my heart. Uh, the plight of small-scale fishers around the world. Um, I have a line of argument that I want to relate to you. I think small-scale fishers or fisheries are small but mighty. They are small in scale, but in terms of if you look at the number of people they employ in the sector, which is more than 90 or 95 percent, and the majority of whom are in the developing world but also their contribution in terms of the fish that's landed that we consume, up to 50% of that global scale is produced or delivered or supplied by small scale fisheries. So yes, small scale in terms of maybe the, the size of operations, but in terms of their contribution, they are mighty. However, they continue to be marginalized partly because there's a, a chronic data deficiency in small-scale fisheries. We know so little about them, and therefore their contribution to our economies and livelihoods is often underestimated, which leads to institutional bias, but also when it comes to investment decisions as well. They are often overlooked. And therefore, I think one way of tackling this is um, unleashing the, the value of uh, small-scale fisheries, and particularly I want to acknowledge these incredible work that Nicole and her team in FAO do, and in partnership with World Fish as well, on illuminating hidden harvests, for instance, you know, to unleash the value of um, or the contribution of the sector um, and uh, make it more visible and hopefully mainstream it to national accounts and thereby influencing policy and investment decisions. Now, there are multiple challenges that small scale fishers or small scale actors face. One of them is, of course, you know, the conflict. Um, with industrial fisheries, uh, and that's which is really common across many countries. <clears throat> uh, 
And of these industrial fisheries, competition between small-scale fishers and industrial bottom trawlers is most acute in many places, many countries. And bottom trawling, the practice of dragging a weighted net and chains across the seabed to catch fish is the most widespread source of human disturbance to the world's seabed. And I've seen this in practice on the ground when I was working as a fishery scientist in Eritrea a very long time ago and going out with these fishing trawlers. And the best analogy that I can use, which is not mine by the way, but I'm sure you may have heard this, is equivalent to almost an activity where you go and clear the forest to catch a rabbit. So that's what exactly what bottom trawling is all about, right? So in terms of, uh, it's, uh, it's highly destructive in terms of uh, um, disturbing the seabed, um, which is a threat in terms of sustainability, but also in terms of um, CO2 emissions as well. One of the high um, greenhouse gas emitting uh, fishing practices as we know it today. But I think more importantly today in this very topic, this took me back to um, an experience in Albania some years ago, where we drove to a deserted harbor. harbor. I'm just going to read to you an extract from my diary that was written so many years ago, but it's still relevant for this event. We drove to a deserted harbor and started looking for fishers who, will, who were willing to talk to us. We approached one man and asked if he would be prepared to answer one question. Evidently drained from long hours of fishing, he politely declined, but kindly offered us some juvenile flatfish from his bucket. If there is something universal I have not said about fishers, it is their generosity. Later, we met a fisherman called Salvatore Toma and his son Julio, who were acquaintance of our interpreter and guide. They greet us with us with beaming smiles. And as my Eritrean would do, using my rusty Italian, I began by asking about the key challenges he and his father face as fishermen. His smile suddenly dropped and he became notably agitated. And I could tell he was about to upload frustrations. Now, one of the key points that Julio told me is this. Julio explained that the coastal waters up to three miles from the shore are reserved for small-scale fishing and large-scale fleets are not legally allowed to fish in this area. However, according to Julio at least, many large-scale fishing fleets, mainly trawlers, come as close as 500 meters from the coast. The competition is clearly a threat, but Julio is also concerned about how these fleets can damage the marine environment. And quite naively, I asked him, doesn't the government penalize those who are breaking the law? I asked quite naively, with a bitter smile, Julio told me how the owners of these fleets are good friends of the big guys, indicating that regulations are not properly enforced. Even if enforced, penalties are as little as six, 300 euros, which big fishing fleets can easily earn in an hour making these fines ineffective as a deterrent. He went on and on and on to tell me about his plight in terms of when it comes to this, you know, being outcompeted by industrial fishers. But of course, I had to challenge him to give me an answer to that, you know, what's the solution for that? And he's quite clever, cleverly, Julio, very intelligent young man. He said three things. One is we need government action to enforce fishing regulations and impose penalties that will generally deter large-scale fleets from encroaching on the area designated for small-scale fishers. But also they want some government support to boost the small-scale fishing market, for example, by developing local market infrastructures such as landing sites and marketplaces where small-scale fishers can sell their catch for a reasonable price but also government action to close the coast for fishing for the, at least three years to allow stocks to replenish, but at the same time using perhaps earnings through license fees to compensate fishers during that no-take season, for instance. What I have learned two things from this, from Senegal to Eritrea, 
from Mozambique to Myanmar, Bangladesh, or Albania. It is striking how this diverse international community is bound by common local struggles. And I think when I talk about this issue, about the conflict between small-scale fisheries and large-scale fisheries, particularly with by bottom trawlers, it's not an issue of a particular country, but I think it's a global challenge in many countries that we can imagine. So to conclude, let me remind all of us to SDG target 14B, which calls on states to provide access for small-scale artisanal fishers to marine resources and markets by applying legal, regulatory, policy, or institutional frameworks which recognize and protect access rights for small-scale fisheries. Incidentally, this is exactly what Julio was asking for. And therefore, without wasting any time, really, it's about mobilizing our resources by working together. Let's make sure we deliver on this particular target together. And thank you very much. Thank you, Isam, for those remarks and setting the stage for our engagement in discussions this morning. As we have heard now, bottom trawlers, and let me give a few figures, drag weighted nets over the seabed to scrape up 19 million tons of aquatic foods annually and contribute to almost a quarter of marine landings globally. While over half of the world's marine aquatic foods are caught this way, bottom trawlers also bring harmful impact across the three spheres of sustainable development, economy, social, and environment. Within the span of 65 years, bottom trawlers have discarded overboard more than 400 million tons of untargeted marine life with an economic value of 560 million American dollars. Discussions on bottom trawler cannot be dissociated from small-scale fishers, as we heard from the examples that Isam gave, and inland <laughs> exclusion zones. And in relation to SDG 14 targets, 14B, provide access of small-scale artisanal fishers to marine resources and markets, as well as 14.4, effectively regulate harvesting and end overfishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and destructive fishing practices, and implement science-based management plans in order to restore fish stocks in the shortest time feasible. And also, 14.6, prohibit certain forms of fishery subsidies which contribute to overcapacity and overfishing, eliminate subsidies that contribute to IUU fishing and refrain from introducing new subsidies. And we are all thrilled with the developments that happened at WTO just a, few, just a week ago. Very often, when we talk about bottom trawling practices, discussions are centered on the fleet, the practices, the zones, forgetting the people, forgetting the small-scale fishers. Poor delineation and enforcement of the inclusion-exclusion zones threaten livelihoods, in addition to food and nutrition security of these small-scale fishers and their families. Voices of small-scale fishers are missing, especially in high-level discussions as these we are having this week, rendering these stakeholders invisible. 2022 has been declared as the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, EAFA 2022, bringing the spotlight and exploring solutions to engage, empower small-scale fishers in affecting transformation in food systems and ocean governance. To move this conversation further, allow me to invite Nicole France, 
Equitable Livelihood Steam Leader at the Food and Agriculture Organization from the Division of Ag Fisheries and Aquaculture to take the stage and deliver her remarks. Nicole will be sharing with us the findings from the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study, which is a collaboration between FAO, Duke University, and World Fish. And this study is to better understand global trends of preferential access areas for small-scale fisheries. Nicole, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Shakuntala, and thank you for the organizers for, for inviting me here. Yes, as, as Shakuntala just introduced, I will, I will share some follow-up work to this uh, so-called illuminating hidden harvest study that we are conducting as FAO together with our partners from Duke University and World Fish. Um, for this study, we have collected data in 58 countries around the world to extrapolate global estimates on the contributions of small-scale fisheries to sustainable development um, based on the sustainable development goals and also the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries. And today I want to share some early findings of additional research that is stemming from this illuminating hidden harvest study that relates more specifically to SDG 14b. We heard it several times that SDG 14b calls to provide access for uh, small-scale artisanal fishers to res marine resources and markets. And FAO is a custodian agency for the related indicator 14b1, um, which measures the degree of application of a legal regulatory policy or institutional framework which recognizes and protects access rights for small-scale fisheries. So building on this, on this SSF database that we have collected or compiled for the IHH study and expanding it actually further, this new research um, looked at legal frameworks to better understand the preferential access areas for small-scale fisheries. And this work is actually led by the colleagues from Duke University, Javier Basurto and uh, John Verdin, who are also here in the audience. So please address your questions to them later on also. Um, this research uh, analyzed the information for countries with a coastline to understand um, if these countries have legally designed preferential access areas for small-scale fisheries. So by doing that and looking at the data, the data showed that for for 47 countries out of 185 countries analyzed actually have such legally designated preferential access areas for small-scale fisheries. Now, to give you a little bit of a sense of, of the importance of these preferential access areas for small-scale fisheries, um, this corresponds to about 1.5% of the total EEZ of those 47 countries. Or if you, we look at it in terms of the continental shelf, it actually um, covers 4% of the continental shelf of those 47 countries. And, and to put this in context and give you a bit of a sense of the importance of these preferential access areas, um, I want to share some of the findings from this illuminating hidden harvest study. We estimated that about 40% of the global catch is coming from small-scale fisheries. And 68% of that catch is coming from marine fisheries. So a lot of that is produced probably in these preferential access areas. It is also important to keep in mind that about 31 million people are directly involved in small-scale fisheries, marine small-scale fisheries, either for harvesting or for subsistence fisheries. So that gives a bit of a sense of the importance of these preferential access areas. Um, another way to look at these findings of these preferential access areas is also in relation to, to the income level of the countries. And the data shows that low and middle low income countries are actually reserving uh, more than the average 1.5% of the EZ, up to 4% of the EZ of, of low and middle uh, income Middle, low middle income countries are reserving that space for small scale fisheries. Um, similarly, if we look at it from a geographical perspective, um, Asia also is allocating a far larger part of its EEZ, up to 5% to preferential access areas for, for small-scale fisheries. Now, this is just um, 
this is a work that's still ongoing. And um, what also came out is that there's actually a growing trend in these in, in the area that is reserved for small-scale fisheries over, over the last decades. Um, there remain a lot of questions that still need to be analyzed. One important question is how much of the small-scale fisheries catch is actually produced in those preferential access areas, um, because they're obviously also fishing in other areas. Again, to, to really understand the value and the importance of these areas. Um, another question is what was brought up both by Assam and by Shakuntala before is how are these preferential access areas enforced? Are they really protected that they are reserved for small scale fisheries only? And another important question that remains to be looked at and that also Shakuntala mentioned a bit in, in her last remarks in terms of the importance of the human dimension uh, of small scale fisheries is also the this to look at these preferential access areas more as a social process. So how are they designated? How are they operated? How are small-scale fisheries actors actually taking part in the designation and in the in the management of these areas? So so that those are important questions that still remain open and um, that hopefully we can stimulate the debate and, and more research and, and policy making around that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, much. Nicole. It's always nice hearing you talk about the people-centered approach. Let's move on. 90% of the fish caught by bottom trawlers in the coastal waters around Africa is caught by foreign fishing boats from Europe and Asia. This further threatens the availability and sustainability of marine resources on the continent and displaces African small-scale fishers from their traditional fishing grounds. Now, please allow me to invite Dauda Fodesein, General Secretary of the African Confederation of Professional Organizations of Artisanal Fisheries, to deliver his remarks. He will inform us on why preferential access are critically important for small-scale fisheries. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. And also, good morning to the panelists. My name is Dauda Fordison, coming from the Gambia, and the Secretary General of CAOPA, in short. Yeah, concerning the topic, it's a very, very important topic. But my take in this is that the problem, Nicole has already just said it, is the problem of the so it's a social problem. We know that when you talk about fishing, it takes into account social, economic, ecological, biological. All these three have been taken care of, but the problem is the social problem. And this is where we have to work very hard. It's not only social, but including also policies conventions, because if you look at trawlers coming to fish in different waters, it's, it's as a result of conventions, particularly the INCLOS, where it allows countries to move from one place to another to fish in countries' waters. And the impact it does is that it causes what we call competition as far as the small-scale fishes is concerned and the industrial fishing is concerned. And I will say that these, how to call it again, uh, the competition, uh, I can break it down into three different kind of competition. We have the interspecific competition as far as <laughs> trawlers and small-scale fishes are concerned. And we have the interspecific competition, I'm taking it from an ecological point of view as far as marine, marine biology or the other things are concerned. And the other one is, the third one is competitive exclusion. So here, the artisanal fishers falls under the third one, which means we are going to be competitively excluded if we allow bottom trawling to go on. So this is our problem here. And how do we solve this? We have to come with some governance mechanisms. And when you talk about governance, we need to look at the three multi-level governance mechanisms that should work hand in glove. And one of them is we have to start with the local governance mechanism. At grassroots level, during planning, implementation, we have to start with 
local governance mechanism. Then you come to the, third, the second governance mechanism, which is the state governance. And then you come to the global governance. So these are the three governance mechanisms that I think the world should utilize to be able to address issues that impact on small-scale fishes. Because when you come to the global governance mechanism, it's very hard for small-scale fishes to be included in decision-making processes, to take part, to participate. And when I say participate, I mean effective participation. We don't have to be there just to tick the attendance box and say we are there. But we want effective participants sit on the tables where decision makers sit and decide. Then our voice could be heard. So this is what I wanted to say for now. Thank you very much for the floor. Yes, thank you so much and for pointing to the solutions that and the actions that we can take, talking about governance and active participation. Next, allow me to shift our geographic focus to another part of the world, Central America, and listen to their solutions and initiatives to strengthen fisheries management in the region. I'd like to invite Elmer Rodriguez, Chair of the Belize National Fishermen Cooperative Society Limited and the recipient of the 2019 Fisher of the Year Award to deliver his remarks. He will share with us Belize's Manage Access Program, including its role in excluding industrial fisheries. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paulino Elmer Rodriguez a fisher from Sardinia, Belize. I have over 30 years fishing, within 25 years dedicating to help leading the National Fishermen's Cooperative Society Limited. I am currently the chair of the managing committee. I'm also a member of the board of directors for Turnip Atoll Sustainability Association, which is co-managed for one of the biggest marine protected area in Belize. Turnip Atolls Marine Reserve, one of the fishing area under the Manage Access Program, where we, the fishers, help to manage. I am also a member of the Belize Fisheries Council, which is a multi-stakeholder group that advises government on fisheries management decision in, the, in my country. My community of Sardinia is one of the largest fishing village in Belize, which depends heavily in fisheries for our livelihoods and an important supply for nutrition, seafood for our families and communities. I'm glad to be participating in this event and have the opportunity to share my, my perspective <laughs> as a small scale fisher and cooperative leader. Prior to the implementation of the managed access fisher, fishers, fishing all over the place for almost every time, and it was pushing our fishers to be in a rush, especially at this opening of the fishing season. Under management, managed access fishers choose two fishing areas where we or she, he or she is licensed to fish. Fishers submit catch data, have vessel color coding for each area and help to manage these fishing area, areas which gives fishers more security and voice in managing this, the resources within their fishing areas through community management access committees in collaboration with the Belize Fisheries Department and co-managing local NGOs such as TASA. Manage access and marine reserves are a key component of Belize's stronger framework to protect our marine ecosystem and the livelihoods and food security they support for our communities. I would say that in Belize, this is a work that is in progress, and yes, we have made some big steps, so as being highlighted by my fellow Belizeans of this conference, including our minister and prime minister, but there is more. We need to be to do such as 
better enforcement to ensure illegal fishing does not undermine our efforts so far. More attention to management of our fish fin fish through effective implementation of Belize's new adapt adaptive fishing management plan. We need stronger leadership from young fishermen. Continue commitment by government to strengthen fishermen participation in fishery decision making. We all know that fishers have the knowledge and experience that is required to be a better stewards of our resources. In, close, in closing, I, to, I want to encourage fishers to take on leadership roles within their communities and help be the voices for small scale fishers and help in, ensure that fishers have secure access to their fisheries resources. I want to thank the organi organizers of this side event for inviting me, Environmental Defense, Defense Fund, and my fellow Belizean delegates that supported my participation in this important conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thank you also for bringing up the all-important point about youth in fisheries as we move to 2030 and beyond. Of course, we all know and should be doing more to include youth in fisheries. I will now like to move the conversation to a non-governmental perspective and listen to an alternative view on bottom trawling and the impacts on marine ecology and biodiversity. Sophie Benbow leads Fauna and Flora International Marine Program and has been working for over a decade in supporting the development of sustainable fisheries projects to better define and reduce the impacts of destructive fishing globally. Sophie will inform us on the preliminary findings of the Cambridge Conservation Initiatives defining destructive fishing project. Thank you, Sophie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, and a real honor and privilege to be here today with such a fantastic and diverse panel. So I'm really proud to be sitting with you all. Um, as mentioned, so um, FFI has been leading a collaborative research project with the University of Cambridge, BirdLife, um, and UNEP WCMC to better define destructive fishing. So if you look at back to the UN framing, if you look at SDG 14, we're seeking to end overfishing IUU and destructive fishing practices. And our feeling was that the destructive fishing practice part of that statement is a little bit neglected. Um, so we led a survey um, which went out last year um, um, and we had um, over 80 respondents from 36 countries around the world covering all sorts of demographics and sectors. So we had NGOs, academics, government groups, small scale fisher institutions, all feeding in to share their thoughts and feelings around what destructive fishing means. The overall consensus is that we do need a definition um, that's coming out very strongly. Um, and largely this would be to improve consistency and to standardize the use of the term and also to contribute more meaningfully to, it, to implementation of global goals and policy efforts around that. There were some concerns raised about if we were going to oversimplify the definition too much, we would lose some of that context dependency um, when we're thinking about the term destructive. A really interesting result that's coming out so far is that there is no clear difference between the sectors. So in the purposes of this research, small scale fishers, government, academia and NGOs are all leaning the same way on certain issues. Um, and there is really clear agreement that some, some fishing practices are inherently more destructive than others. Um, the interesting areas of disagreement um, that we're still trying to dig into a little bit more um, are around the context dependencies, so the nuance of the term whether it's always destructive if a gear is used in a certain way at a certain time of year or in a certain place. And also picking up on some of the words um, that have been spoken here already around the social and economic impact. So whether or not those aspects of social and economic harm should be considered destructive is a point where we have really strong disagreement across um, the, the respondents that we've had so far. 
Um, we're now moving into a third round of the survey to try and hone in on some of these key areas of disagreement. Um, and we will be running workshops with a broader group of stakeholders over the summer. Um, if anybody would be interested in engaging in the process, please do talk to me afterwards. Um, we're really trying to bring in as many people as possible from a diverse group as possible. Um, and the survey was run in multiple languages, so we were trying to, to engage as many people as possible. In terms of gear types, um, bottom trawling is, of course, ranking up there in terms of disruptive, its destructive nature. Um, it's ranking in the top five. Um, and as a result of that, Fauna and Flora International um, co-founded, along with Blue Ventures, EJF and Our Seas, the Transform Bottom Trawling Coalition that was mentioned at the start. So this is a collaboration of 54 organizations from over 24 countries coming together to tackle and transform bottom trawling, an incredibly destructive fishing method, um, which is so prevalent in our global supply chain. The coalition has four calls to action. Um, we seek to freeze the footprint, so to stop bottom trawling happening in areas where it has not happened to date, to end subsidised bottom trawling and reallocate those resources to support a fair transition, considering the social elements of transforming bottle trawling, to prohibit bottom trawling within MPAs, so some progress has been made on that recently, and the most important one, given the panel that I'm sitting on today, um, to establish, expand and strengthen national IEZs for small scale fish fishing from which bottom trawling is prohibited. And I know there's an awful lot of work to do. And it's a real pleasure to hear from local representatives from around the world on some of these really critical issues. And FFI is really supportive of collectively us all coming together to transform this fishing method, which is not good for the ocean. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, and for reminding us of the importance of sound and relevant data and common definitions which are relevant for all. Now, let me move the conversation to the efforts taken by a governmental agency in managing the impacts of bottom trawling especially in the context of national productivity. Today we have with us Chalamachi Suwanarek, Director General of the Department of Fisheries, Thailand. Please do share with us the steps taken by the Department of Fisheries, Thailand, regarding this issue. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator, distinguished and participant, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. My name is Chalem Chai Swanarak, Director General of uh, Department of Fisheries Thailand. First, I would like to thank the EGF and organizer to opportunity and allowing me to take the floor in the this important this side event. On behalf of the Department of Fisheries of Thailand, I would like to share with you on uh, the initiative and action taken by government on the issue of small-scale fishery and travel in Thailand. Under Thai Fishery Law and National Fishery Management Program, the Department of Fishery implement measures to protect additional fishery and marine resource. Firstly, the coastal sea, which is less than three nautical miles from baseline and reserved for additional fishery only. Secondly, spatial and area crosser measures are implemented, especially travel are prohibited in the crosser area. These measures are to guarantee that coastal sea and are protected from prowler and preserved for additional fishing. Ladies and gentlemen, as trawl are identified as high efficiency gear, no more trawler in Thailand. We have been prohibited to register new fishing vessels and not issue the, the fishing license to trawlers since 2016. The number of permit trawl has been dramatically reduced more than 600 vessels during the past five years. The department encouraged fishers to change the, uh, their fishing gear from trawl to low efficiency gear which are selective gear, the registration prohibit on industrial fishing vessel will remain in effect. 
to support artificial artisanal fishing vessel. Thailand has recognized artisanal fishing vessel through vessel registration. Currently, there are 51,000 registered artisanal fishing vessels. To reduce fishing capacity of fishing fleet, Thailand has also implemented fishing vessel buyback scheme. To remove fishing vessel from the system, there, there are now 1,838 1, fishing vessels preferring to exit the system, including 541 trawler, which cost 30 million US dollars for the government to buy back. And this trawler is our first priority for this buyback scheme. On trawler are need to have a commercial fishing license. They are strictly controlled and monitored at all time of fishing operation. They have to notify port out and port in, install the VMS on board for vessel tracking uh, 24 hours a day, report catch in fishing logbook, and they catch have, no, have to be inspected at landing port. The fishing effort and catch of the trawl gear have been controlled. Number of fishing day for trawler in Thai water has been limited. As a result, the fishing effort and catch have not uh, not been exceed the MSY level, and overfishing over fishing has not occurred since uh, 2016. Trawl fishing is also one of our four fishery improvement projects in Thailand. The department intends to develop trawl fishing to be sustainable according to international standard. Currently, Thai trawl fishing have been pre-assessed and a fishery action plan is being developed. If the department is able to fully implement the action plan, it can be assessed to ensure that Thai trawl fishing meet international standard for sustainability. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to conclude that we recognize trawlers are considered to impact fish stock and seabed ecosystem. Thailand is going to reduce the number of trawlers in our water from time to time. Our, our, our outstanding measure are the, the completion program of Thai trawler, freezing the trawler vessel registration and fishing licensing, as well as reducing their fishing capacity. It can be assured that the number of trawlers can effectively be reduced from time to time by this measure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much and congratulations on the launch of such a strong action plan with precise, time-bound and measurable measures. I am sure through the implementation of this action plan, it will create change, not just for Thailand, but for the regions and for many nations surrounding Thailand, also including Malaysia, where the World Fish Headquarters is located. Now, allow me to invite Maxine Mansonto, Director, Belize Blue Economy, to complement what we have heard from Elmer earlier on the role of Belize's managed access program in supporting small scale fisheries. Maxine? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to first thank the organizers for inviting Belize to participate, both from the government side and from a representative from the Co-op for Small Scale Fishing. Um, it's a pleasure for me to share with you the progress that Belize has made in the inclusion of our fishers in the fisheries management and government process in Belize. As previously mentioned by our MC, the, this, is, this year is an important year. It's the year that the United Nations has declared 
as the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, which brings to light the significant importance of the contribution of small-scale fishers, fish farmers, and fish workers to the human well-being, healthy agro-food systems, and poverty eradication through the responsible and sustainable use of fisheries and aquaculture resources. A contribution that, as the FAO Director General stated, small-scale artisanal fisheries and aquaculture are small in scale, but big in value. It also serves as an opportunity to raise awareness about the importance of sustainable fishing practices and to highlight the need to protect our marine resources to ensure a sustainable fishing industry for generations to come. As Mr. Elmer said, it's reaching out to the youths to include them in the sector. Every year, Belize dedicates the entire month of June as Fisher Folk Month, involving a series of events celebrating our small-scale artisanal fishers and also awarding a Fisher of the Year. Similarly, Belize itself is committed to sustainable management of its small-scale fisheries through the implementation of its new Fisheries Resources Act which was enacted in 2020. The app incorporates modern and relevant principles of fisheries management, such as precautionary approach to fisheries management, the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fishers, voluntary guidelines to securing sustainable small-scale fisheries and the ecosystem's approach to fisheries management. It was, the act ensures that the legislation is aligned with national laws, regional policies, and international obligations. Its objective is to promote long-term conservation, management, and sustainable use of Belize's fisheries resources within our territorial waters. The fisheries management framework is supported by a nationwide system of territorial use rights for fishing called managed access. This gives Belizean fishers secured access to coastal fishing areas and resources. As Mr. Elmer meant, said, it, it's divided upon groups. Managed access within the Act is now legally defined. It's defined specifically as Belize's fisheries management tool that establishes secure fishing tenure for fishing areas, often also called territorial use rights for fishing or TERFs. Managed access allocates secure licenses to fish in a specified zone called a managed access area. It's the fishing zone for the fisher. The Act also makes provisions for the creation of fishing priority areas and special management areas which can be co-managed. Uh, I think one of the co-management agencies that was mentioned for one of the zones is exactly what Mr. Elmer had referred to, the um, TASA which has one of the zones. In part, the, basically what the app makes provisions for is, in part or in whole, with a locally registered non-governmental organization, fishing cooperative, fishing organization, or another organization, local community, or other being a party, for any area to which this act applies. So currently Belize has, I believe, eight managed access areas, and it can nine. Nine, I apologize. The expert is correcting me. Nine managed access areas. And depending on the area, it's either community um, co-managed or NGO co-managed, as the case may be. Furthermore, a multi-sectoral cooperation approach involving public-private collaboration is at the core of Belize's fisheries governance structure. Belize remains committed to participatory governance framework whereby fishers and the fishing industry representatives have a direct role in the fisheries management decisions. At the local level through organized committees and at the national level through membership in our fisheries council, a multi-sector group that advises the government on fisheries access, fisheries matters, sorry. The Ministry of Blue Economy and Civil Aviation, which is a relatively new ministry within the government of Belize, formed in 2020, and a first for the government of Belize. And the Belize Fisheries Department have prioritized science-based adaptive management of lobster, conch, and fin fish fisheries. These are the primary commercial species, species, primary commercial species in Belize. 
to ensure sustainability and resilience in the face of climate change. This year, the adoption and initial implementation of multi-species fin fish management plan is a key priority to support the livelihoods and food security of Belizeans as the management plan aims to promote the sustainable use of fin fish resources. This takes pressure of heavily exploited near shore resources such as the Caribbean spiny lobster and queen conch, two of our most prized commercial species. A process that was done in close consultation and guidance with the fishing community and other stakeholders. The Ministry of Blue Economy and the Fisheries Department has also approved a mariculture policy that provides the guidelines for further economic opportunities in the sector and has initiated the implementation of a fisheries policy strategy and action plan that will focus on five key priority areas one being conservation and management of fish and ecosystems, second being research and development of the fisheries sector, third is enforcement and compliance, fourth is capacity building and knowledge management, and the fifth is governance, fisheries governance specifically. Of course, this process will be consultative and include our local small-scale fishers. Our commitment to the sustainable management of small-scale fisheries is complemented by Belize's most recent commitment to protect 30% of its coastal waters by 2020. I believe the recent NDC published actually says 2026. So we're going ahead of schedule. Belize's recent blue bonds also has set within its targets a conservation commitment that include priorities for developing marine spatial plants, and designation of special biodiversity areas for this protection of our resources. Additionally, and I'm hoping I'm saying this correctly, in April, Belize recently declared 11.83% of our oceans as no-take zones in high biodiversity areas. These efforts and commitments supported by the government of Belize will ensure continued progress towards a healthy and biodiverse ocean and securing access for sustainable use while balancing the development of our economy. In all of these measures, we have worked with the small scale fishers in country to develop and implement these activities. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine, for let us, letting us know of the strong multifaceted actions taken by the government of Belize in collaboration with communities and other stakeholders. Allow me now to bring us back to Africa, in particular an island country, to listen to another set of strategies that were taken by the government to safeguard small-scale fishers and their livelihoods through the implementation of inland exclusion zone. Jose Victor Rangia Manana, Director of Blue Economy Madagascar, will highlight the relevance of the Madagascar Development Plan for Fisheries and the impacts of establishing a two nautical miles exclusion zone for ship shores. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the, uh, giving me the floor. Uh, distinguished um, panelists and uh, colleagues and guests, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you uh, today. So uh, basically, the the vision is to breathe a new life into the Madagascar traditional fishery. So just to give you the context, uh, Madagascar is located in a zone of the southwest Indian Ocean, which I said is a, has been evaluated in 2017 to be around 333.8 billion US dollar. That's the general asset. We have uh, 1.141 kilometers square of e EEZ, nearly 5,603 kilometers of coast, um, and then um, approximately 5,000 kilometers square of coral reef, longing um, 1,400 kilometers on the on the south, uh, sorry, on the west coast of Madagascar. And um, when we talk about about small scale fishery. Many countries are already really good into artisanal fisheries, but for us, 61% of the global production is still uh, given by the uh, traditional fishery, meaning um, archaical 
uh, gears, the boats that has been used th since Methuselah, uh, and really, really um, uh, strong and, and, and difficult conditions, climate conditions, of course. Um, just some numbers uh, for you to understand also the things. Uh, IU fishing is causing us around six, 16 million dollar loss every year. 80% of this coral reef I talked to you about are at risk. Due to climate change and uh, stronger wind, uh, there are only 83 days per year left for fishermen to go to fish. 83 days per year. Habitat destruction, uh, climate change, all this coming together. And these 600,000 fishermen and the families really struggle to make their living. And also to illustrate the global consumption of uh, aquatic food is around 18 kilos per person per year around the world, 11 kilo per person per year in Africa, but in Madagascar it's 4.26 kilo per year. So you know the, the, the difficulty we, we have to, yeah, to, to, um, to deal with. And to be really concrete with you, talking about the poverty, majority of fishermen are living with $1.98 per day for a household of four, five children. So you see uh, why we really have to um, upgrade the traditional fisheries. So uh, one of the main things we want to do is to modernize ocean governance, to ensure safety and security, tackle IO fishing, and, and so forth. Um, for that, we have decided to modernize the tools you use for uh, securing and, and making our uh, EZ safe by using drones cause, uh, and, and, uh, and um, 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 rapid uh, fleet. Um, and also ensure that each of the 14 coastal region has their own fishery management plan, which is actively led by fishermen um, um, communities, actually. We just use a conservation society to catalyze the, the, the effort, but they are mainly led by, by fishermen communities. We're also trying hard to deploy more technicians from the government into the, the coastal region, not to have them um, all working in the capital, which is always the, the main m mindset since uh, de uh, decades, actually. And uh, developing a space of MSP, sorry, is of course one of our target, main target to um, uh, have a, ensure sustainable growth. Uh, talking about MSP, um, Chair talked about this uh, exclusive zone for for fishermen because the problem is um, all the f all the industrial fisheries were um, obliged to operate beyond 20 miles on the west coast because it's a shallow uh, area and beyond eight miles on the east. But when it comes to um, shrimp um, fisheries, they always operate very close to the coast. And that was a problem. It generated a lot of conflicts. Um, so many boats were, well, traditional boats were destroyed. Uh, the gear was destroyed, damaged. So uh, for some years now, um, by official decree, we have decided to not allow them to operate any longer uh, within two miles. And um, this is a first, but with the development of MSB, we would like to improve and to, um, to give more chance to the uh, traditional fisheries to, to evolve. The second point is to upgrade traditional fishery, of course, by modernizing the the, the fleet, um, the embarkation, and the gears. Um, there is another problem because the, this traditional boat has made, made, are made with a, a, a tree called Givosia madagascariensis. So the population has decreased. Just for two years now, the international conservation has uh, forbidden the, the cut of, of these trees. So question, where will they find the first material to build a boat with, uh, all these fishermen. So uh, we've worked with uh, the World Bank on the project called Swear Fish 2, and also from inner um, uh, financing to provide fishermen with um, um, upgraded uh, embarkation, actually. And this is to promote deep, deep sea fishing. So encourage them, uh, empower them to be able to go fish beyond four miles. So the, targeted, the target is to lower pressure from zero to four miles, and within this area, promote conservation and other um, sustainable new income generating activities like al algae cultural, uh, allotria culture, which is already giving us very good um, uh, results uh, now, actually. And also we want to develop value chain 
and um, uh, or try to build up new port to uh, empower or give other source of revenue of income to this fisherman uh, population and of course trying to to increase the uh, the livelihoods and and, and um, uh, human development index so that's what we can say and uh, we're looking forward to working with, with you all for uh, uh, more um, uh, intel in this in this project thank you very much Thank you so much, and it's really interesting to hear of the special considerations that must be taken by an island state for the actions. This concludes the first round of remarks from our pan panelists. I would like to now move to the second part of our event, where we will give the panelists, the panelists will join me in a moderated discussion to better learn and understand the impacts of their work in managing bottom trawling and synergizing their efforts to achieve SDG target 14B. Do let us keep in mind that we have a time to end the event, so I'd like you to, to keep your remarks short. And I'd firstly like to move to our panelists from Thailand. As governments move away from bottom trawling. There will still be hundreds of thousands of bottom trawlers in existence. What experience does Thailand have in dealing with vessels that will no longer be in operation or which cannot get licensed to fish? And how will you address this as we move into the future? Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there will, no, will be no more vessel registration and licensing for new trawler. The vessel decommissioning <coughs> program has been implemented in Thailand since uh, 2017. Up to now, there were uh, 305 vessel bought, uh, bought back by the government with the budget of 22 million US dollars. This year, our government is preparing the budget of 14 million US dollars for the decommissioning program for 75 vessels. The vessel owner have to uh, have to scrap the vessel under the overseeing by the government official. When the vessel is completely scrapped, the owner can apply for compensation from the government, thus it can be assured that the vessel will completely be removed from the, the system. Thank you. That's amazing to hear of the strong government actions and with funding behind it to implement the plan. Next to you, Nicole. You have presented a set of very comprehensive data informing us of the global trends on preferential access for small-scale fishers. May I ask you to tell us how will, how will these data be used to convince governments to make important policy change and investments to secure the rights of small-scale fishers? Yeah, thank you, Shakuntala. Uh, very good question. Um, the, the, the rationale behind the, the illuminating hidden harvest study that, that tries to, to, to bring more data, more evidence to inform the contribution of small-scale fishes to sustainable development, in fact, has, has, has been driven by that intention to, to shift the narrative to look at small-scale fisheries in a more comprehensive way to, to look at it through different perspectives, not just in terms of fisheries production, but really emphasizing more the livelihood dimensions of it, the who is producing what and for whom. And we often use that, we, we, we know that narrative, we hear it in many, many talks, but, but we're still lacking the evidence behind it. So what we feel is, is, is really bringing this um, this to the next level through this illuminating hidden harvest study is, for example, the work that was led in the study also by, by our colleagues from World Fish, and that is to bring together, for
for example, nutrition data with small-scale fisheries catch data, because that really gives much more information about the importance of what small-scale fisheries are producing and how that is actually contributing to the available nutrients for, in particular, more vulnerable parts of the population. So by, by generating that data, by sharing that information, by, by taking a more multidisciplinary approach, um, we hope that we can really draw attention to the importance of small-scale fisheries, not only within fisheries administrations, but also, for example, um, for policymakers that are in charge of decisions in relation to food security and nutrition, but also in relation to gender, to social development. And through that, secure the access rights uh, to the resources and to markets for small-scale fisheries in the long term. Thank you, so, um, thank you, Nicole, and, and thank you for reminding us that even though we are concentrating on SDG 14, there are, it's integrated that there are links to other SDGs, for example, to zero hunger and malnutrition, and to SDG 5 on gender equity. Now to you, Sophie. We have heard about the preliminary findings that you all have generated on destructive fishing and illustrating the negative impacts which are associated with bottom trawling. What do we now need to do to translate these findings into policy recommendations and actions frameworks by which nations can move? It's an excellent question that we're currently dealing with. <laughs> So I'm not sure I have the exact answer for you, um, but the next step in the process is, is to try and get closer to a definition. Um, so a third round of the survey and then these workshops, which will seek to bring in a broader stakeholder group again into the process. Um, we are hoping to engage with the FAO um, as we go forward from a policy angle. Um, but I also think a, a route that we're leaning towards a lot is engaging industry. So trying to develop some kind of risk assessment tool so the fishing industry can look and assess through their supply chain and understand how much of their seafood product is being sourced from destructively destructive practices. Um, so a combination approach of engaging industry and looking to understand where the policy change might be um, so that governments um, and local fishers can understand how they can then implement methods and, and regulations around destructive practices. Thank you, Sophie. And let me now move to our two panelists from Belize. Both of you presented a very strong case of supporting small-scale fishers through the Belize Manage Access Program. May I ask you to share with us the limitations to the implementation, if any, and give us one immediate action when implemented that will ensure critical success for small-scale fishers. Magdalene, let me start with you, and then we move to Elmer. Um, I would have to say one limitation in the, the process at this moment is enforcement. It's the funding for enforcement. It's the actual rangers to be out there to assist and enforce and guide that. It's um, basically capacity, and it's the same for many small island developing states. Um, we have eight managed access areas. We have over 13 marine reserves. We partner with co-managers primarily because of the need for capacity that is lacked on the government side and even on their side because the funding that they manage to obtain isn't enough to protect or guide that area. So what we have seen being done at the fisheries department is looking at tools, um, whether they be digital tools, <laughs> uh, what are they, the, the rovers, uh, different methods of trying to track and enforce. Um, that is the limitation and that's the area that needs support. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Maxine. Um, one of the things I would like to say is that uh, the implementation of the manage, manage access uh, program has um, assure our fishers that uh, whenever uh, fishers go there, um, there is um, the, the, the product that is um, they're targeting, um, that there will be um, 
not in um, trying to find where to go, but uh, there's a, a direct um, area where fishers um, do their fishing. So it is important for us as fishers, and um, as we know that, um, and we had men mentioned uh, that uh, uh, the, the, uh, it's important uh, that we keep the um, the, um, the fish the fisheries alive. So it is important for us to manage access. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Maxine, it's important, especially in the forum as we have with this conference, with many nations, um, with very different economies, that we talk about the need for capacity and the support that need that is needed for capacity. Now I'd like to move to Africa, though very different, the countries being very different. Successful implementation of strategies in Africa are often challenging, as we have to balance national economic growth with ensuring that people's rights to access to food and nutrition, livelihoods, and access to the ocean. Similar to my previous question, may I please ask you to share with us the limitations to implementation and what is one immediate action when implementing will bring us further on the track to achieving SDG 14b? Let, let us start with Dauda. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, Chair, uh, Madam MC, for that very important question. I think uh, as far as the overall management and conservation protection or MPA is, is concerned, and in the area of co-management in general, or participatory surveillance, I think our fear or our challenge is protection of fishermen. Because if we should go to do some kind of participatory monitoring with government, we have no protection. If there is any accident at sea, there is no guarantee that we are going to be compensated. Government may be compensated because <laughs> they have some arrangements, but fishermen with government, there's a problem. And according to the FAO Voluntary Guidelines 2014, it has provided for insurance scheme for small scale fishers. But up till now, I cannot tell you how many of our governments have really started working on that insurance. And without fishermen, no fish. We're not going to get fish because the fisherman brings the fish and feed the world. So I think we should start working on that. And when it comes to also in terms of participation, it's not yet guaranteed. As far as our fisheries legal instruments are concerned, you may have a management plan giving exclusive use rights, but are those management plans gazetted to be able to give the fishermen the legal standing to be able to fight what is right. So I think it is also another issue that needs some, you know, redress. And also in terms of access rights, we have several instruments like the governance of Cheno of land, fishes, and forests in the context of food security. These are not even applicable as far as small-scale fishers are concerned. Sometimes you ask a title deed, else you are moved from where you used to be for many years. So these are also the areas that I think uh, we need to know. We all have the, all the instrument necessary, but the problem you have is implementation. And how are we going to implement that? It needs a collaborative, kind of a global approach to be able to get to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. May I move to um, Tauda? May I move to Jose for your comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, exactly. Um, well, the ocean is used by different sectors. Um, and of course, the, the decision made, uh, which most of the time ends up to the uh, fishermen, because they are the, the people that use it more often than the others. Uh, well, putting in place a cross-sectoral and intersectoral committee 
to deal with the ocean related uh, decisions uh, is always a challenge because um, uh, all the sectors don't have the same priorities and the same uh, vision on how to to deal with the uh, with the ocean and its ecosystem and resources but at the end it's always the fishermen that pays the last the the the, the, the has bill so um, that's one thing another thing is um, that policies make to uh, to ensure that the marine ecosystem are well managed should come from the fishermen not imposed by the government the appropriation of uh, national policies is very important and uh, we have good example for that uh, in the southwest of Madagascar. We have this uh, uh, community called Velunjiaki that used to work with the Blue Ventures. I've been with them last uh, two two months ago um, to integrate new nautic zones, and actually, this nautic zone hasn't been uh, demanded by the conservation agencies or by the government. It was by themselves because they understood the importance of having nautic zones for for for. Uh, improvement of the livelihood and, and, and the better health of the environment. So you see, when, when it's, the appropriation is there, government has just had to catalyze and to, to, to frame. You don't have to do the, the, the biggest job. So, so that, that's one thing we have to, to make sure. And of course, having the right human resources and technicity is also very important. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It has really been heartening to moderate this session because there were so many different perspectives, but so many specific actions and solutions that were given. And, 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 the, and we moved from being general to very specific. So I'm sure the audience has enjoyed that. Let, me give a, let us all give a round of applause to our panelists. I'd now like to move to invite two small-scale fishers representatives present with us today to deliver short statements. First, may I invite Micheline Sofili Dion, a member of KEOPA, and KEOPA is the African Confederation of Professional Organizations of Artisanal Fisheries, uh, representing the women fisheries of Ivory Coast, to deliver her statement. Okay. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je suis Dion Sampli, Micheline de la Côte d'Ivoire. Je suis coordinatrice des programmes femmes de la CAOPA. C'est la Confédération africaine des organisations professionnelles de pêche artisanale. Je voudrais ici rappeler le rôle important que jouent les femmes euh, dans la pêche artisanale. Il faut dire que les femmes sont présentes à toutes les étapes de la chaîne de valeur, euh, au niveau du mariage, la transformation et de la commercialisation. Les femmes aident les pêcheurs et elles préfinancent euh, la campagne de pêche. Euh, ce que je voulais souligner concernant euh, cette, euh, euh, ce chalutage de fond, c'est d'abord le fait que euh, nous, à notre niveau, nous pouvons considérer le chalutage de fond comme une forme de pêche qui est même et de tout ce que euh, l'humanité a connu comme euh, le plus grand crime dans les eaux maritimes, c'est la pêche ILN. Et nous considérons ce, cette forme de pêche comme l'un des plus grands crimes. Cela affecte euh, une, euh, le travail des pêcheurs. On considère cela comme une pêche complètement déloyale. Et ça affecte le travail des femmes. Et il faut reconnaître que c'est les femmes aussi qui s'occupent des familles, de la, des enfants de l'éducation des enfants, de la préparation des repas. À partir du moment où cette pêche fait tant de mal dans les eaux, il est important que les recommandations de cette réunion prennent en compte l'amélioration de cette pêcherie et lutte pour que cette pêche soit vraiment, ne puisse pas aller de l'avant comme aujourd'hui ce que nous sommes en train de constater. Je remercie ici tous les organisateurs et les panélistes qui ont parlé et en l'occurrence, euh, euh, l'organisation Blue Venture, il lui souhaite beaucoup de succès dans le cadre de cette lutte pour cette euh, mauvaise pêche qui affecte énormément nos communautés. Je vous remercie. Thank you so much, Micheline, and thank you so much for specifically highlighting 
women in small scale fisheries and as a major part of the fishers who work with small scale fisheries. Next, again by Flavio Lontru, who is on the board of directors of the Ibero American Artisanal Fisheries Network and represents more than 20 million fishers to deliver his statement. Bom dia a todos e todas. É, eu, eu gostaria de deixar uma coisa bem registrada aqui. É que é, não acreditamos mais em governos. Nós entendemos que precisamos fazer uma, um movimento mundial da pesca artesanal Good day to everybody here. Um, I would like to ask everybody that we should no longer be listening to governments. We need to do, to make a world movement of uh, artisanal fishers. Então, é, entendemos que nos oceanos hoje existem dois câncer que vai, vão matar tudo. Um são os plásticos e o outro é a pesca de arrasto. Não, não se precisa muito para definir o que é pesca destrutiva. Destrutiva é acabar com tudo. As redes passam e destroem tudo que encontram pelo caminho. No Brasil temos uma experiência no estado do Rio Grande do Sul, onde proibiu o arrasto nas primeiras 12 milhas a partir da linha de costa. E o resultado dessa proibição é que a pesca artesanal produziu mais de três vezes mais do que vinha produzindo. Então, é uma experiência exitosa, é alguma coisa que deu certo, de fato. E isso aconteceu por pressão dos pescadores brasileiros em cima do governo. O que os políticos entendem é pressão manifestação, não há outra forma de, de se conseguir que, que os governos efetivamente trabalhem. Se hoje a pesca de arrasto é um problema em todo o mundo, então precisamos acabar com a pesca de arrasto. Então esse é um recado que fica, não temos tempos, tempos mais a perder é, com... Uh, não temos mais tempo a, per a perder uh, discutindo ou definindo palavras. A pesca, a pesca de arrasto não pode mais acontecer. So we shouldn't waste any more time discussing the meaning of words. What we need to do is just end bottom trolling. Muito obrigado. so much for your strong call to action. We have now heard from a vast variety of speakers providing us with strong strategies and solutions on how preferential access areas for small scale fishers and inshore exclusion zones which are free from destructive industrial fishing such as bottom trawling can protect livelihoods, biodiversity, and ecosystems, and provide food and nutrition security for the people who are engaged. In this decade of ocean science, we recognize the importance of science-based evidence and data to support policies that will advance us further in achieving the targets of SDG 14, and in particular, SDG 14b. With these data and evidence, we can call upon member states and all others in, cons in consultation with fishers organizations to develop constructive and equitable solutions to mitigate the impacts of bottom trawling on our fisheries, ecosystems, and climate, and the effects that it has on the people, the small-scale fishers. 
I urge all present here today and those listening in virtually to learn more about the campaigns of Transform Bottom Trawling Coalition and join us in our call to all coastal states to establish, expand, and strengthen inshore exclusion zones in which industrial fishing, including bottom trawling, are prohibited and with preferential access areas for small-scale fishers, and that we should do so and make sure this is secured even before we reach to the end of SDGs 2030. Before we close, let me recognize the many partners who have brought us together today. This event is hosted by the Transform Bottom Trawling Coalition and co-organized with partners. And these include Blue Ventures, the Belize Fisheries Department, Madagascar's Ministry of Fisheries and Blue Economy, World Fish, the African Confederation of Professional Organizations of Artisanal Fisheries, COPA, the Mineral Foundation, the Environmental Justice Foundation, Corner and Flora International, the Dakshin Foundation, the Indonesian Traditional Fishers Association, Project Seahorse, Duke University, the Environmental Defense Fund, and the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. Let us all give a hand to these parties. And with these words, I conclude the session and hope that we all work together to meet the goals that we have set out to do. Thank you so much.